whether to the computer or or to something else, I just end up running around. That's funny. Uh, <laughs> this is the OGM check-in call on Thursday, February 1st, 2024, first day of February. Um, uh, just as a note, uh, I had previously scheduled a governance call, topic call for later today, and just realized that my travel is going to complicate it, et cetera, et cetera. So I moved uh, that schedule forward by two weeks, sent a note to the OGM list, and I will send a proper invite to that call after this call, which everybody is welcome to forward to whoever else. But uh, So there's no 10 a.m. call uh, today on the topic, 10 a.m. Pacific. Uh, with and my apologies if that messes people up who did invite lots of other people but um i think this will make it a little better for all of us uh, this is a check-in call we are in check-in mode uh, i don't see anybody who doesn't know how to do the dance uh, so i'm going to go quiet i will encourage us not to use the chat too much during the check-in round uh, feel free to take notes on your own uh, and then share them at the end of check-in if you'd like. I will not uh, be traffic uh, controller during the check-in round. Uh, so I will just step back and use your Zoom hand or just step in if nobody's got their hand up, but that's how we'll know what the queue is. And um, feel free to take a pause between everybody speaking so that we have like some quiet periods in between. That's one of the virtues of our check-in protocol is that uh, we take our time checking in and just being present with one another. Uh, please don't go twice in the check-in round. Just go once and wait until everybody's had a chance to check in. And then we will go into general conversation in our usual flowy mode. Uh, with that, I will step aside and see who would like to take us in to today's check-in. So I guess I'll go first. Uh, it was great to have uh, Jerry and Pete, and then um, she, uh, we also had um, we, I had a I hosted a um, a celebration of Doug Engelbart's 99th birthday on Tuesday, and uh, ended up having yeah the the cause some of the key people um, Rhoda Hagland he's done. Uh, um, he's really been focused on Doug's, um, on the word processing part of it, the future of text, and he's developed some tools in, um, for the Mac platform on, on um, trying to bring in some of that functionality. And then um, Simon Buckingham Shum, who was at Open UK for quite a while, but he's in Australia now. And I'd sent him a message and he said, I got, I'm under deadline. I, won't be able to and then he did show up anyway so i was very happy to see that um and um, then got um uh, well i've um, been quite involved in the international society for the system sciences and we're actually going to be having a conference here in washington dc um at the university of district of columbia and then, and then i just found out that Field and Graduate University, we're going to have our in-person summer event in Washington, D.C. at the University of District of Columbia. So it's um, great that I won't have to travel. I was expecting to have to go to Chicago for that. So, so the main things. And then I'm also, in, I've been trying some experiments The Doodle poll isn't working well um, and stuff, so I'm just going to pick some times. But um, Sunday is actually the 56th anniversary of, of Martin Luther King's um, The Drum Major Instinct sermon. And then I don't know if you saw the MSNBC documentary a few years ago, but um, Harry Belafonte actually hosted The Tonight Show February 5th to 9th, 1968, had... Uh, Martin Luther King on there, RFK, like a whole bunch of people. So, yeah, so just 
looking to organize something and want to have a conversation around around that. So um, I'll, I'll be posting that on, as LinkedIn events. So hopefully some of you will be able to attend. Uh, well, uh, I might as well <clears throat> take uh, the second bite of this cherry. Uh, well, what's top of my attention uh, right now is uh, futures of democracies and uh, governance. Uh, this morning I listened to <clears throat> uh, last week's uh, recording of last week's OGM uh, call about governance. Really fascinating. Uh, I wish I had been there at that discussion, but the uh, the recording of the call plus the, the chat uh, makes it accessible for me. And I will be able to make three of the four scheduled calls in, in Jerry's email, so I do hope I'll be able to uh, contribute to that. Uh, uh, as uh, most of you know, because I've talked about it before, I'm very busy uh, with my co-organization of the uh, uh, Iceland conference about the futures of democracy starting the 21st of uh, February. Uh, I know the website's been put into the chat on other occasions, and uh, I can put it in again after I'm uh, taking this uh, turn at the microphone. Uh, and uh, as I had said before, uh, it's going to be a working conference. The second day will include three full day parallel future labs uh, about uh, important drivers of change uh, in society. Uh, the lab that I'm uh, going to facilitate is about uh, governance paradigms and uh, institutions. And to prepare for that, I've been working the last couple of days on a, uh, a short handout about some of the challenges that the governments and people living in democracies are facing. Uh, things like uh, a general fear of the new and the fear of the future and the fear of the other and people being angry at being shut out of society, or not being listened to or respected, a hunger for more certainty, a general dumbing down of people due to education systems failing, media attention span issues, uh, the idea of elections as a competition with winners and losers, things like that. So uh, I'm trying to work out uh, a sort of value neutral uh, expression of, of ideas like that so people can take them or leave them as they start talking themselves about how they see the challenges to democracy and what they think is important to do with them. And the uh, second thing on my uh, mind these days is uh, the uh, continuation of the uh, uh, the initiative for intergenerational uh, dialogue uh, in this year. Uh, also talked about this and written about it uh, before. Uh, we're looking at organizing or helping other people to uh, to organize up to 10 or 12 sessions between young people and uh, society's elders in as many countries as we can find. 
And uh, the topic is in this big election year, what does uh, democracy mean to me? And what does voting mean to me? Why should we vote in elections? Uh, so we're investigating how to find people for that type of initiative. Uh, this morning, I spoke to a friend and colleague in Italy who is helping to uh, work with a youth assembly in one of the larger uh, states of Italy, Emilia Romana, where Bologna is the capital. They've prototyped a youth assembly where young people between six and 12 and another group of young people between 13 and 18 are looking at how they can influence uh, lawmaking and the issues that get discussed for uh, preparing uh, policy deliberations in the regional elections there. Uh, yesterday, I spoke with someone who was facilitating uh, world cafes with university students about uh, how they see the future, and he's going to put it to a number of the students uh, to see if they're interested in these type of uh, intergeneral conversations as well. So nothing really new as far as things I haven't said here before, but those two work processes uh, I'm involved with are moving on. Hi, Judy. Welcome to the call. The strange silence. I don't remember how many of our check-in calls you've been on, but we, we're taking lots of time to step into the circle and then participating only once, uh, so just as a reminder. So that, Thank you. So you don't think, what happened to these people? Nice to see, nice to see you. Likewise, everybody else, too. Thank you. Okay, maybe I'll step in. Um, so we started, uh, my partner and I started to um, get into into sort of ground level of the industries. We have been developing a networking meeting <clears throat> with different, with uh, medium-sized companies um, in the food business throughout you know, the supply chain, farmers, all the two, um, CPG producers, consumer packaged goods uh, uh, producers, and and everything in between, and it has been in incredibly regenerative. I mean, just completely beyond um, our expectation and how receptive um, this group really was. Um, and then what you realize is that <clears throat> the missing link in this creative soup really is. For them to be connected so what what um occurred to me in the boss is actually what my next newsletter centered around this topic is that um when when you work in a in a large corporate setting you have any resource you need uh, a, a phone call away you know you need uh, some engineering uh, talent or you need uh, finance or uh you know business planning it's right there and you have uh, you know, specialists uh, joining your team, coming in and out as you need it as a project lead. Well, when you're working by up by yourself, um, there's a lot of blind spots you have uh, in the marketplace that you that are not uh, uh, really visible until you you get deeper down into the operational environment. So there's some. Um, uh, there's a lot of failures you now in the startup business simply because you know they missed uh, something in the supply chain they weren't aware of or 
uh, there's a consumer acceptance issue and so on and so on. So <clears throat> we actually uh, had such a, a good feedback that we are pitching today, not uh, the 10 o'clock today, <clears throat> to a co-op in the Palouse that, that, has, that operates over 2 million acres of uh, mostly wheat. I mean, farmland, one of some of the most productive farmland in the U.S., and we're connecting them with a European um, uh, flour mill that is mounted on a 40-foot truck, a container, and can produce protein extracts uh, from virtually anything, um, which is the hottest market out there right now, is to produce protein extracts. And to do that locally, meaning you have zero shipping cost, you know, the entire uh, process is there. Um, is uh, is opening up a, a plethora of opportunity for farmers to grow, um, to grow small batches, smaller batches of highly localized types of crops uh, that are that are um, like perennials, uh, perennial grains, and so on that are very uh, uh, productive to restore the soil. You now they sequester the nitrogen into the soil. But so far, these farmers don't have a market for these products. Uh, they get uh, so particularly not a value-adding market. So here's an opportunity to do this in a prototype way. Washington State University has an extension there. Idaho State is right uh, 10 minutes away. On the other side of the border, the Palouse is right between this triangle of Oregon, Washington, and Idaho. So we're super excited uh, about this. I've worked with this team in the Palouse before. So they're, they're, they're very motivated, uh, you know, super, super uh, uh, engaged uh, people. So we're very excited about this. I think this is this is just going to work because Siemens coming in, I mean, the company that does the, that produces this technology is Siemens, which is one of the largest electronic firms in the world uh, based in Germany. So we have uh, all the resources we need uh, to to make this work. But then, you know, instantly it comes to mind um, creating a project like this has a flow, you know, and uh, uh, the imagineering type of um, project flow is just uh, uh, very conducive, you know, to bring it to to get through these stages of design, feasibility check. You know, design ad ad adaptations, another you know, feasibility check, and so on, and work towards something that has you know, a really good chance to making it work. So, um, I I think we just need to really turn towards practical things you know, that uh, that can actually uh, make a difference in the field, and if. Uh, and and to to assist you know these these uh, innovators in the market to get a foothold <clears throat> and to get gain access to these tools and and resources that uh, that are uh, I mean that take a lifetime. It's not just knowing that there's a tool, but also how to use it and and how to work this process. It just takes a, a lifetime of uh, learning you know, to to. Uh, to get your mind wrapped around it, so yeah, that's uh, that's a big departure, um, and uh, um, you know, I've been working with nonprofits for the last six years or so, um, but we just there don't just you just don't have the resources, and 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 uh, and it really doesn't translate you know, into into a practical application of actually creating a product you know, that that works. So I'll uh, I'll let you know when when we have something more tangible. But uh, and the interesting, the fun part is that in this meeting, in this networking and working meeting, we had the CEO of a consumer packaged goods at the table, and she's going to be coming right up front into this meeting. So. We basically have a farmer and then we have an end producer and we can now communicate what type of product, what type of uh, protein do we need, you know, for this kind of super popular product 
uh, and so we have from the from the get go we are having farm to table discussions. You know, where we are exchanging market intelligence going both directions. Yeah, so uh, so I'll speak. Um, uh, first thing I want to do is uh, a little bit of show and tell. Uh, I'm about to put on um, some socks that I bought as a souvenir uh, on safari in Africa. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't worn them. It, it, I, I bought them in October. And the other thing that I happen to have on wearing today it's a wonderful T-shirt that um, my late wife bought me many years ago. She saw it in a window in a store in Berkeley and had to buy it. And I, I hope you can. I hope you can see it. <laughs> Great. So, um, I want to thank Jerry and everyone for the opportunity to to share because as people were sharing, I was making some notes about. Um, what I've been up to and what's been going on and um, eh, good stuff. Um, so uh, some things are starting to uh, come to fruition. I've been frustrated uh, over the last uh, months, uh, in part uh, frustrated in, in an inquiry about the notion of doing versus being. Um, and what I think is starting to happen is so many of the discussions and, and little projects that I've been involved are starting to um, move uh, into a little bit of doing. And, and, and I'm, I'm kind of gratified in some way by that. Um, the Thoughtful Citizen Handbook, um, which um, Jerry is writing a chapter for, is starting to come together. Um, um, and it's taken on a global aspect, which I'm 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 very pleased with. Um, I think that the uh, the Neo Book project is just is is about to start to move into um, a kind of a, a a doing phase where we're actually uh, putting out stuff that's um, that's of value. Um, Society twenty forty five combined with 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 um, Jose's radical is starting to get some traction in terms of uh, doing things um, which is uh, really good um, the, the Meg Wheatley spiritual warrior stuff we're starting to do some some more things out in the world um, kudos to um, to Gill and to Doug B um, for introducing AI uh, into the conversation, because I've been playing with that of late with um, with my, quote, burgeoning uh, piece of writing called Getting to Relationship. Um, and, you know, the AI tools are wonderful writing partners when you start to learn how to use them. I mean, they they can provide extraordinary um, uh, benefit and, and, and value. Um, so that's the kind of the stuff that's been going on, let's say, um, outward facing. Um, inward facing, uh, it's, it's a really, I think, an interesting time. Um, I just got back from a week in New York, uh, staying with my sister and visiting family. And um, it was an amazingly grounding feeling um, of ordinariness. Um, and it kind of reminded me of of, um, of, a, of an occurrence that happened, I don't know, 20, 25 years ago. I was going to a Halloween party <laughs> and I decided to go as just an ordinary person, whatever that means, <laughs> meaning as opposed to some Superman or Batman costume like thing. I just went in a you know scruffy pair of jeans and an old pair of sneakers and a baseball cap. And ordinariness came up um, in a Zen calendar entry, which is something that I look at every day. 
um, and, and the Zen calendar entry was, um, in Zen, we're always told to leave the danger of the high places and go to the path of safety. That path means just ordinariness. To be able to return and settle in normality is the final stage of Zen. And it was just like, oh boy, this is really interesting. And it came up also, um, you know, I got back from uh, a week uh, in New York and Jennifer's been working in Europe. And, and one of the things I said to her was, you know, it's really interesting. I was sharing what my experience was like in New York around ordinariness. And I said, it's really interesting that uh, to some degree, you and I both live in these identities that we've created. <laughs> um, as opposed to the ordinariness you get when you're with family and visiting old friends, you know, to be called Stewie by a couple of old friends was just so incredibly, um, wonderfully heartwarming. Um, yeah, exactly. You can't, you can't beat that stuff. Um, you just, you just can't beat that stuff. And to be embraced as Uncle Stewart by nieces and nephews and great nieces and great nephews is just a, a, an amazingly warm um, feeling. So I think I'll leave it at that. Ah, today's Zen calendar entry. I would like my life to be a statement of love and compassion. And where it isn't, that's where my work lies. And that's a, a Ram Dass quote. Guess I'll go next. Um, Stuart's mention of of uh, feeling like things are taking shape in some way, like there is a a movement towards doing, and that that this year so far has felt very much like a um, a reality, and it's and it's happening in surprisingly uh, collaborative ways. Um, been communicating with uh, with folks across the pond on on some movements that are happening there, um, and wanting to collaborate. It's like what collaborate? What, what? Uh, for so long everybody's been trying to uh, build their own thing and trying to figure out how to position themselves and what's different and different and. Uh, you know, thinking through a lot of work over the years uh, to to do this, um, the stuff that needs to be done, and to see communities actually reaching out to one another, uh, unprompted, un un uh, unforced, uh, is is um, both heartwarming and uh, really practical because we're starting to see how those pieces uh, come together. Um, the the work that we're doing within uh, radical and moving towards radical world, which is um, an understanding that the work we had been doing in um, the world of work um, is too limiting. Um, we can't just work and help people reorganize in a different way. Uh, we need to help people see the world in a different way. Um, and that that seeing the world is the underlying uh, way for us to be able to make those changes. Um, for the last four or five years, we've been running into issues of, you know, bringing people together who sit, show interest in, in changing how their organizations work to, to be more self-managed, to be more uh, human, to be more compassionate, to be a whole bunch of different definitions of what that means. And it turns out um, that we don't know how to do that. 
even though we want to do that. Um, and uh, we don't know how to do that within organizations. We don't know how to do that in an ecosystem of organizations. Uh, and we don't know how to do that in our society. So how do we, how do we look at that uh, at, at a bigger picture? And so that's the, the direction we're going. And the, the Neo book uh, project that uh, Stuart mentioned um, is, uh, as I've spoken to, um, to Pete and Jerry, um, is an effort to bring more folks to be involved in that question of what have we seen that has caused the society that we have uh, as seen as the reality? Uh, and what is the reality that we can see that will allow us to do the things we all want to do? We just don't know how to do. Um, and so that's the that's the goal. It's a it's a project that I would love for as many of you who uh, would like to be involved. Um, in, includes bringing um, bringing voices like yours to the table, not just to talk about what you see as a future and whatever efforts you're making towards making that future come about, but also, um, or more importantly, I think, to talk about what brought you to the point where you think that's necessary. What experience have you had? Because there's so much power, especially us older folk. Uh, there is so much power in our experience. So many young people already feel what we feel, but have not had the experience we, that we have had. And so they cannot connect with something in their past. They need to connect with something in our past. And we need to tell that story. And I think the more stories we can tell, the more diverse the stories we can tell, the more um, it will resonate for more people. And so that's really what that book's about. And so that's something that the 2045 and Radical are gonna be bringing together with, um, with uh, the Neo Books project, uh, hopefully that will they'll work for us and, um, and open this up for everybody to add to that book. It's not a book written by any one person or any group of people. It's a book written by us, and that includes you. Um, and so how do, we, how do we do that multilingually, uh, culturally, uh, adapted to different cultures as well, and find ways to, uh, to tell that story? So that, that's the work we're doing. It feels like we've turned a corner, um, and it's um, a lot of work ahead, but it's, it's good work. Thank you. I had two different thoughts that I'd like to share briefly. One was that I think how we got here was the intense focus on individualism, the the notion of competitiveness, personal competitiveness, and you know to be the best meant you were better than others and distinct from others, all of which is, seems to me a significant misconception of the right way to run the world. <laughs> and I think there's a lot of things we could do to address that, but I, not rather than go in that direction right now. One thought I had was that I wonder whether you might have considered in your book inviting participation from grandmotherly, grandfatherly type people or other wise people, just as like a, an insert, not a not a treatise, but you know, three or four paragraphs or something small that just drifts along place different places in the book that might have an opportunity to share a bunch of these experiences in a context that could be particularly constructive. I don't think I'm supposed to be speaking again, but to answer your question, we, we've, the, maybe we can have an off, uh, offline conversation because sure. the way that we've structured it is a little bit different than the average book uh, and it may answer your question. 
Thank you. Thank you. And I can see Jerry smacking my hand for speaking twice. Now a third time. Oops, a fourth time. Whoa. Judith, was that it on the check-in for you? Oh, <laughs> I, I guess I, from a check-in standpoint, I've been doing a lot of the same sorts of things in the various nonprofits that I work with, um, trying to put in place as I'm sort of exiting as a senior, um, the inclusiveness and the sense of vision and continuity that the nonprofits need to have and the diversity in their board participation that will help them assure that to happen. So we've been doing a little bit of OD in some of the nonprofits and some future visioning and things like that. And that feels like a nice legacy to leave. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. And thank you to all who've spoken. Um, um, Gary, I think we're not supposed to reference things that people said previously, but I'm going to do one since we have a precedent now for rule break, rule breaking. Thank you, Jose. Um, uh, you know, what you mentioned about uh, young people needing to connect with stories in our past really resonates for me right now. I've been noticing, um, noticing, noticing a shift in the conversations that I'm hearing from um, the kind of okay boomer dismissal of older people. We need to focus on younger people, get younger people on stage, don't have older people on stage, which I've talked about before is a challenge to getting speaking gigs these days. Uh, and I'm detecting people saying, you know, we really need to get some of this elder wisdom and experience and understand what's gone before and the shoulders that we're standing on, the work that preceded the work that we're trying to do now. So I think you're very timely uh, with that. And I'm, I'm encouraged by that. Um, um, let's see. Um, I, I've also been poking around in the neo books world, or I guess Pete, maybe the neo book adjacent world. Uh, I'm not looking to write whole books uh, together just yet, but to in, engage engage the crowd in refining some work that I've done previously. I've I've been in a period of creative ferment, both doing new writing uh, and also looking at prior writing that I've done. Um, and I've talked with Pete about taking um, my now 15-year-old book, The Truth About Green Business, came out in 2009, was extremely well-received, great, great reviews on it. And we wrote it to be relatively timeless, principle-based. Um, and it mostly holds up on that count. But, you know, 15 years ago, the, 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 the case studies need to be different. The examples of what's been done needs to be different. There are elements on the landscape of sustainability and business that weren't there uh, 15 years ago. Um, and so I'm looking at, um, at, do, at updating the book. This is like, it's, like a, it's like a green business for dummies. Uh, Truth About is a Financial Times press imprint that I took the rights back from. So I'm looking at doing uh, an, an update and then putting it out in the wild and inviting people to comment and suggest and provide additional, you know, uh, updated examples and what's missing and what's stupid and so forth. So we're moving forward on that. Um, and then um, I guess not neo booky, but, um, you know, uh, uh, but adjacent in my mind because of the online publishing component and um, back to what Jose was saying about um, uh, our past. Um, 30 years ago, I did um, a, a bi-weekly column for the LA Times Syndicate on business and environment. I think one of the first of that sort. Uh, and I'm looking at pulling those, uh, doing a, a, a collection, an anthology of, you know, collected essays anthology, maybe under the title of The Roots of Sustainability, uh, or maybe something else. I'm open to suggestions. But to provide um, the tens of thousands of new kids in the game, with some perspective about what it looked like um, 30 years back and the building blocks that a lot of the current work has been built on. So um, open to thoughts and ideas on, well, thoughts on whether that's a good idea or not, whether it's the right thing to call it. Um, and um, I'm having um, 
having a lot of fun exploring the technology options and how to do this thing in a way that's both streamlined for me and cool for people who encounter it. Um, in that context, I also have been uh, doing a bunch of playing around with AIs. Um, yes, Stuart, very much as a, as a partner, as a research team. Um, uh, I um, got two major projects underway, which I think I've talked about before. Uh, one is with the Living Between Worlds um, um, webinar history um, that, um, you know, monthly conversations that Ken and I have been hosting. And by the way, last month we had Hunter Lovins as our guest. I don't remember if we talked about it here before, but it's a very um, uh, um, uh, lively and engaging and realistic perspective uh, on the climate crisis, the COP conferences and so forth. So I encourage you, if you're at all interested in that topic, it's a terrific resource for that. Um, so we built, uh, we've trained an AI on that corpus of you know some forty or so conversations over the last four and a half years, um, um, and uh, piloted it in our session in December, and we're working on refining it now. I just discovered uh, yesterday um, that I could ask the AI to look at the corpus and give me a series of tweets that I could post from it. So I'm starting to play with that. It's a little stupid. Needs some needs some help. Um, but, uh, you know, sort of looking at how to enhance the workflow, give people, uh, uh, give people good jewels that also will attract them into the conversation. Um, and the other project is, um, is a, um, is a coaching bot. You, you all know that I've been doing one-on-one -on -one coaching for a number of years, uh, uh, ontological perspective focused on people who are leaders and leaders leaders and emerging leaders in the climate and sustainability realm. Um, and uh, it's been deeply gratifying work, both because of the impact that I'm having with my clients. So I'm finding that the one-on-one -on -one work with people is in many ways a lot more satisfying than the grind of trying to move a large organization uh, and sell consulting projects and, and that big game. Um, so um, I'm gratified by the impact I'm having on them or what they say is the impact I'm having on them. And I'm also really surprised at the impact it's been having on me. Uh, how every single coaching session, I come out with discoveries about myself, uh, insights about myself, new moves that I can make. It was really, it's a surprise in that work. Anyhow, um, um, I'm in the process of extracting all the transcripts from all the clients over all the years, scrubbing them to de-identify them. Uh, and then dropping them into a language model. Uh, and by the way, the all of these, uh, I'm finding that all of these uh, uh, recording bots, Fathom and Otter and so forth, are really good at what they do. They are not very good at user experience in managing the archive of sessions, extracting, exporting, extracting, sorting, and so forth. Not, not good there at all. Um, and uh, so we built a preliminary coaching bot aimed at that stuff. It ain't bad so far. It's not, not good enough for anybody to see yet. Um, the motive there is twofold. Um, one is to uh, is to just make this work available much more widely. Uh, as you can imagine, one-on-one, -on -one, I have to charge for something. Um, and a lot of people can't afford that. So I'm looking at something that could go out free or very inexpensively to a wider universe. And then, yeah, also it would be nice if it could be a monetized a, a source of, of, of financial flow for me. Um, the experiment, the, the, the current experiment, I'm sorry, I, I guess I'm going on wrong, but let me just say one more thing. Um, to try to um, uh, uh, move the stochastic parrot into a more useful direction. Uh, I've been looking at giving it a kind of context of, you know, where do I come from? How do I, I don't want my, 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 my technical partner is out of the world of programming and machine learning and is inclined to provide um, if then instructions. Like if you hear a phrase like this, say that, uh, which of course is not how human beings work in conversation. There's elements of that, but it's something much more amorphous and cloudy, but I'm trying to characterize what are the, where am I coming from? What are the traditions I'm standing in? What are the flavors of approach that I do? And so I've been trying to build a short list of the lineages that I'm standing in. And um, 
it was going to be three or four things and it's now seven or eight. And what the list is now is that I'm informed by ontological, ecological, Buddhist, Hasidic, Aikido, transcontextual, somatic systems theory and language actions perspectives and an attention to what Gregory Bateson called the pattern that connects. So uh, I say that to you for a couple, uh, a, a few reasons. One is you all know me in some sort of way. I'd welcome your suggestion of words that would characterize the lineages or perspectives that I'm standing in. Um, I welcome your reactions to the list that I just read. And this has been a very fun exercise for me. So I invite you to might want to try it for yourself at some point. Um, last two things. In the in the work on this this morning, I discovered a paper from Stephen Nachmanovich, a, a, a musician, improv, improv, improvisational musician, and a close student of Gregory Bateson, who just published a paper called uh, Being Whole, W-H-O-L-E. And I'll get a link to, out to you later. It's a, it's a really, um, for me, very rich and provocative uh, reflection on the work of Gregory Bateson uh, with a lot that's relevant for many of the themes that we're talking about here. Um, and last but not least, I was on a webinar this week with a guy named Nipun Mehta, M-E-H-T-A, who some of you may know. He was the founder of Service Space 25 years ago or so, um, which is a um, an international, now an international volunteer organization um, focused around generosity and 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 and, and folks around generosity, I guess, and flow. Nippon um, created Karma Kitchen some years back in Berkeley, which was a restaurant where you don't pay, or you pay what you want to pay. Um, and um, um, I, I mean, you, you look, servicebase.org, look it up. It's profound in what they've done. And it got me wondering about um, moving from it naturally we moved years ago from selling time to selling projects. And we experimented with asking the clients to pay what they think things were worth, which is still transactional, um, as opposed to just, you know, doing stuff to do it and see what happens. And so I'm sort of beginning a thought experiment of could I do something like that in my coaching work and in my consulting work? What might that look like? How do we move out of the transactional rest? Reciprocity is good, but transactional is a bit of a trap. And if we look to living systems as our teacher, which I often do, it's rarely transaction. So that's just, that's like, a you know, pebbles in the pond generating ripples. That's a big stone that got thrown in the pond and is rippling in me right now. And I will stop there. Thank you for listening. I guess I'll step in. Uh, I unfortunately was late and I have to leave a little early. Uh, I think I know most, almost everyone. I'm Mike Nelson, live in Washington, D.C., but right now I'm in Palm Springs because my wife works at Sunnylands, the, uh, the state of, the former state of the Annenberg family. And uh, she had a long business trip and I decided to come along and do my work here. Um, two weeks ago in the last check in, I, uh, was pretty pretty down, uh, just overwhelmed by the amount of bad things going on, the amount of information you have to consume, both professionally and just to keep track of all the bad things going on and, and maybe spot a place where you can make a difference and push the arc of history towards something better. Um, I'm a little more overwhelmed, but also more hopeful this, this day. Um, one thing is that uh, I discovered an amazing essay by the former head of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, where I work. Some of you may have seen this. It came out a day and a half ago, 
William Burns, who's currently the head of the CIA, read a, wrote a very insightful short essay on state spycraft and statecraft for foreign affairs, and foreign affairs put it outside its paywall. So grab it while you can. It's uh, not very long, but very deep, and you might end up reading it twice. Um, covers a lot of topics very, very nicely. The other thing I found is uh, a, a great podcast from Tuesday with Brian Kloss. He's written a number of books. The most recent one is called Fluke. And he also was kind of going through how did we get in this mess and what are we going to do about disinformation and polarization and political violence and not just in the U.S. but around the world. But at the end, he had some positive points on how we can start fighting for truth and uh, perhaps as individuals help other people find sources of information and sources of satisfaction. Um the other reason I'm a little more optimistic is I finally pushed through my writer's block and I'm finishing a project on uh, uh, digital policy. And it's a really big picture look at how Korea, Malaysia, United States uh, are tackling these really tough political issues. They're, they're, they're digital policy issues, but they're they're really hard because they're, they've become political. And yesterday's hearing with five of the CEOs of the social media companies highlighted this, uh, just a four hour um, festival of PR and sound bites and theater. I, I've never seen this before. They, they, they were looking at how social media has destroyed or at least damaged um, young people and they invited all the parents or they invited parents of probably 40 different people, victims, people who had committed suicide or people who had found drugs online. And they had them sort of as a cheering section for the senators as they pounded on Mark Zuckerberg, the CEO of Twitter, the CEO of uh, TikTok. It was, it was, I guess it's the next step. You know, Trump has shown us that, you know, how, how to do campaign rallies. And these guys have decided that rather than using hearings for fact finding, they would use hearings to generate pressure on the social media companies and basically browbeating them into saying, yes, Senator, your bill is great. You should definitely do that. Even though anybody who has analyzed these bills for more than 20 minutes knows that they would be incredibly damaging. I mean, they wouldn't fix the problem and they would cause all sorts of other problems. Um including collection of huge amounts of data, violations of privacy, and preventing teens from finding each other online and, and finding resources they need because they would be censored out of most of, most, much of what they'd want to get would be censored. So it, it's, it was, uh, uh, it, it, this, uh, as they say, this, this book was, uh, this, uh, the book is, the latest book by Kloss is called Fluke, but the podcast, on the Bulwark platform was called Why Everything We Do Matters, which I also thought, also thought was a kind of powerful, um, powerful uh, uh, motto. But going back to my professional work and the digital policy, it is the same thing there. You know, people are just kind of giving up on a lot of this and they're not looking for real solutions anymore. They just want to be seen as pretending to solve problems. And, and it's all about PR, not policy, uh, PR, not progress. And I'm hoping this little paper will poke some holes at some poke, poke some ribs of some policymakers in this country and Brussels and elsewhere and, and get them to start focusing on real solutions. Because we've we've been very stuck on policy because so many different groups have so many different agendas. And it's easier for politicians to just stand up and say, well, my goal is to protect everyone's data and make sure we can monitor bad people online at all times and to make sure that our national security is protected and to block Chinese apps. Uh, it's, it's just kind of a hodgepodge of, of contradictory goals. So if anybody has a way to cheer me up a little bit more, that would be good. Um, but in the meantime, I'm spending a lot of time finishing up this project and enjoying being in Palm Springs and 
away from home where, you know, I don't know about you, but when I sit at home, I often look around and just see seven projects that I haven't gotten to yet that I really should fix up or whether it's filing or fixing a, a window. A long ramble. Hope it was useful. Um, and I hope I gave you a few uh, URLs that you might find helpful. The, uh, the force of humans talking to humans is strong with me today. I'm feeling all of you as you show up and report in what's up. Other things in the world have been sort of reinforcing this, and I'm just feeling those dynamics a lot. Uh, and part of what I wanted to report in on was something that I experienced over the weekend when April and I were in San Diego for a workshop. A few of you have heard some pieces of this if you've been on calls with me earlier this week but I wanted to relate something there. And I also uh, got a chance to hang out with Pete and his wife in person, uh, which was simply awesome. It's been years and years since we actually were in the flesh together and it was lovely and San Diego is beautiful and it was sunny and we went out and saw the ocean and the bay and things like that. Um, part of the workshop, uh, well, the, this workshop was run by a woman who is an NLP master, Neuro Linguistic Programming. She is a terrific facilitator of groups. Uh, she was very experienced and really good. Terrific sense of humor, but also this insane sense of how the human spirit shows up, what happens to us through life in our interactions with family and others, how we process or fail to process that maybe how to liberate some of that. All of that was kind of in the room in the workshop, which is really interesting. And we did a, a couple of different exercises, one of which was a family constellation, which I had heard of before. In fact, uh, in, during the dinner, uh, I'd never participated in one in person and I'd heard of them and I was a fan. And during the, the opening dinner on Friday night, 
we got my little table of four got into conversations and I brought up internal family systems therapy, which we did some of, and family constellations, which we did some of. And uh, so I was really excited that that happened. <clears throat> and I'm, I'm just going to describe a little slice of the family constellation so you have an idea of what it is. And I'll, I'll give a bit of the punchline first, which is, uh, and Michelle, our facilitator, said this going in and then said it afterward. She said, um, this works every time. We just don't know why it works. We don't understand it. We have no, no understanding of why. So before the exercise, she asked anybody who wanted to sort of deal with some issue to uh, who would like to volunteer to be the client of the exercise, because the constellation is for one person at a time, to put their names in a hat with a brief, brief description of the issue they were trying to fix or, or get let, let go of. And uh, I don't know, probably a dozen people put their names in a hat. One was drawn. And Michelle drew the, uh, somebody else drew the name. Michelle looked at it and didn't say a word and then asked for two volunteers. So two people stood up, she put them in front of her, and then she stood behind each of them, put her hands on their shoulders, and then walked them sort of into the circle, because everybody was sit seated in a circle, and put them someplace that felt right, did that for both of them, and then interviewed them and said, what are you feeling, roughly? And pretty much instantaneously, they both went into very intense feelings. Um, and uh, the first person who went out uh, started feeling shame and sort of uh, rage and like was and, and just you could you could see it you could feel it and then I talked to him afterward he said I don't I don't know what happened but 30 seconds after she sort of assigned me and when she assigned these people their roles she didn't say a word didn't tell them what the role was didn't tell them what was up none of that but they instantaneously went into this connection with what turns out to be a very accurate probably very likely accurate uh, representation of what that person in that situation might have felt. Then she um, asked for two more volunteers, and that, that was all it for the volunteers. Then after a while of going back and forth and sort of asking these characters <clears throat> and turning them a little bit toward each other and, you know, what well, now what are you feeling? Can you report in? Just, just sort of pulling that out. And she did this really beautifully. And then asking them to say things to each other <clears throat> that she heard in what they were saying or reporting back. Then she went to the person who was the client in this thing, which none of us knew who it was, uh, who then stood up, went and sat next to Michelle, although Michelle was walking around a whole bunch, and started crying because this was her life situation. And it was apparently uh, really accurate. Uh, and I'll, I'll give a piece of the plot, which is that this was a person who had been adopted. And what turned out was that the characters being represented by those of us in the room. And I was not one of the four who stood up and, and, and represented some piece of this constellation, but um, it, it had to do with, with the birth parents, the biological parents having to give up the child and what that had meant in her life, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it was, at some point, everybody was bawling. Um, it was truly powerful. And uh, I think that gives you a little flavor of it. If you have a chance to participate in one, just go for it. Like I can highly recommend it. Um, and um, and at the end, Michelle again said, "This this works every time, and we don't know why. Can't tell why, but it was uh, it was profound for me as well. And it's it's profound also for not just the client, but also for all participants and bystanders and everybody else. Uh, the people who volunteered to step in ha experienced something very." Uh, emotional and it, at times physical one of the people who would who was representing um felt like she had like like super heavy and basically lay down where she was she's I, I just have to lay down i can't stand anymore uh like that so it, it it showed up and it showed up in spades and it was a um, delightful example of human dynamics at play with that i'm complete for now Thank you, Jerry, for sharing that. Um, that may be parallel to what I was going to say earlier. I, I wanted to um, pick up with what Judith and Gil was saying and just add that there is an importance there of matching what the listener wants to ask with what the speaker wants to say. And in like in what you're talking about, it's happening naturally and nobody can actually say what's going on. Um, 
I wanted to share this. I have this book here by my friend Molly Sargent, and she wrote a book that's called Sane Response. And it's a book of poetry, but she writes it in a way that she leads you on her journey through grief and healing, but she invites you to take the journey with her and add your own voice. And the particular poem I wanted to read is called Her Own Sweet Voice. And um, it's really what I think, you know, the people in this group are not, are, are different than let's say the regular people that you'll see on Facebook. When I look at Facebook, I see people that are dying to have their voices heard <laughs> and maybe some of them shouldn't, but the need is still there. And so I think it's, anyway, should I read this poem now or should I wait until the end when we usually read poems? It feels like a lovely thing to do right now. Okay. Please. Okay. There is someone residing in you or waiting beside you, not fully seen nor heard, yet yearning to be. Please share with her these poems from me. By chance, she may know my voice. By circumstance, she may find resonance with my words. Just as soon, she will encounter a choice. My vulnerability will mirror her vulnerability. Welcome or wearisome, comforting or uncomfortable. Understandably, she may be reluctant to acknowledge our connection. Will she be like me? exposed by these expressions. No matter resonance, not exposure, is the point of my writing. Firstly, resonance with myself. Being visceral, resonance is its own advocate and will not be ignored, not by her, just as it would not be by me. No longer complicit with the dark, her many hidden parts, will demand to be brought into the light, refusing to continue out of sight, only aided or resisted in their wish to reunite with her. Resonance, a passive force, becomes a choiceless choice. So remind her, will you gently, how resonance for her, as for anyone, in poetry, songs, Sex, a walk in the park, yields connection. Oh, how she craves connection, firstly with herself. I send love to her through and in and by these words. I encourage her to write down hers. May she find resonance and welcome its choice in her own sweet voice. Thank you. They see the author again. Molly Sargent.
I'll go. Uh, good morning. Thanks for thanks for being here, and it's wonderful wonderful to see all your faces. Um, it's super fun seeing Jerry uh, with my wife uh, hiking on the on the you know above the the ocean, seeing the bay, seeing the pelicans and and the wind and all that kind of stuff. It was super fun. Thanks, Jerry. Um, uh, the Neo book stuff is coming along pretty well. Uh, we're coming at it from a multiplicity of directions, which is kind of a Neo books way. I think one of the things we maybe learned this week was um, Jay picked the name Neo books because books are are an evocative uh, thing for for our culture, um, especially people a little bit older, I think maybe. But um, we talked about different ways of thinking about them and and the the big part one of the big parts of neo books is that they're made of pieces um and the pieces can come together um in some way or they could be taken apart and put together in another way and sometimes it's a book sometimes it's a slideshow or presentation sometimes it's a video um, we're talking about integrating um, podcasting and audio interviews and things like that so um, a thing to know about neobooks is it's a lot more about collecting and sharing. Um, maybe I, I was going to say information, but maybe stories is a better way to say it. I think some neobooks will be, you know, information, but a lot of neobooks will be stories. So, um, uh, you could either come to neobooks calls on Mondays, uh, or you can ping Jerry or ping me, and and uh, you don't have to be part of like the core of Neobooks experience. Um, Neobooks itself, the project sits in amongst several related kinds of projects, working on text and working on hypertext and working on sharing information and things like that. So uh, Neobooks is kind of like the, the, the center of, of an interesting set of communities and efforts and people and projects, it, but you know, uh, some of the people I think who are participating in neobooks think neobooks is on their edge, uh, not in their center, which is fine. Um, uh, I'm a little bit sad <laughs> to be a correspondent this week, perhaps, uh, from the AI world. Uh, so on the one hand, I'm super happy to kind of tell people some interesting things from the AI world. And it's not going to be very technical this week. Um, but on the other hand, uh, it's either a really important tool that we're going to have uh, as we move into the next uh, 10 or 20 or 50 years um, or not. It, it feels like it's going to be really important. Um, it also, I don't know, this week it feels a little trivial to me. Um, like there are more important things to talk about, but um, it's where I live and, and work right now. So, uh, so here I am. Um, as a transition from the neobooks thing, uh, there were about six or seven of us who got together, six or seven AI uh, explorers uh, who got together uh, a couple months ago and we wrote, we, we did about half of a neobooks experience, um, half, half neobooks and half conventional. Um, so that was a, a, a trip um, and fun, and I can bring some of that experience of doing a compressed, let's write a book about something um, experience to Neobooks. This book happened to be a, about AI futures. It's called AI Futures and Anthology. Um, our leader was an amazing person uh, named Cindy Kuhn, uh, and it's I'm almost embarrassed to say this for whatever reason. Uh, it's right now it's a, a print on demand book paperback uh, in Amazon and it's apparently doing pretty well. Um, so I'm gonna grow into, into that a little bit more, I think. One of the communities that I'm in uh, that is really amazing and if you're interested at all in AI, I recommend checking it out. Uh, it's called AI Salon. Um, and it's uh, one of the main instigators of it is Kyle Shannon, um, an old friend of Jerry and me, um, kind of coincidentally. Um, he's, you know, I, he's one of the early tech adopters uh, as a non-tech person. Uh, so a year ago, uh, he and some friends started this thing called AI Salon. 
Um, they have uh, two hour get togethers uh, every other week on Tuesday, kind of afternoon, late afternoon, evening. Um, and then there's an ongoing uh, online community. Uh, and it's a really, the, the, um, the feel of the community is, uh, you know, hey, this is something new and super interesting. And all of us are new here and nobody knows a lot more than anybody else because everything is so new. And there's a lot of sharing and giving feeling to it. So uh, it's a, a friendly and welcoming and human place uh, to kind of live and grow into knowing a little bit about AI or a lot. And we have a lot of people there uh, who you would think of as regular people. Um, they don't have tech jobs. Um, uh, uh, they're different colors, they're different genders. Um, uh, they're different ages, especially, and it's really surprising to see who are the experts <laughs> because they're not people that you would expect. Um, and it's kind of funny. Some of them are very bashful about it. I'm, I'm a little bit bashful, and some of the other ones are even more bashful than me. Um, one of the women is doing these amazing art pieces, and she's like, I don't, you know, I, I'm nothing special. I'm just, you know, playing around. Uh, you could all play around the same way. She's actually kind of special. There's a lot of stories like that. Um, uh, and, uh, so it's AI Salon, ping me some other way and uh, we can talk about it. I can, you, you can either kind of jump in by yourself or I could give you the uh, 15 and 10 or 15 minute uh, penny tour and say, here are the different sub communities you kind of want to think about. Um, it's, it's kind of big. It's grown from, I don't know, 500 people a few months ago to a thousand people and it's growing fast and they're trying to grow it fast and they're starting actually uh, in person meetups too. They've been doing uh, in-person meetups in Denver in the evenings um, right after the, the big uh, group call online. And um, they're starting to, to have those volunteers are, are starting to spread that in, in different cities around the US, hopefully around the world at some point. So one of the interesting, uh, they, sometimes they have a guest speaker um, and, uh, at these uh, things. And uh, this week's was really a really interesting person. It's somebody who's worked for Pixar for 12 years or something like that. And he's starting up a kind of an indie animation studio. And so he went through a lot of stories about, you know, um, poking their toe into uh, uh, AI, uh, how you do animation, why you do animation. And a big part of the reason he's involved in animation is to tell stories. Uh, so he's done a bunch of like tech slash art stuff in a number of the Pixar movies. Uh, and he was telling us for a while about uh, Inside Out. Uh, Inside Out is from 2015. It's a Disney Pixar uh, animated film. Um, it's got uh, it's got an interesting mix of it's a cool story and it's also very emotionally affective. Um, uh, so the way he described it, uh, a lot of the movie is actually uh, the story of, of the main director watching his teenage daughter uh, grow into you know through adolescence and turn into a different person, <laughs> um, and kind of the the background of how hard it is to be an adolescent and stuff like that. And um, he showed us a short clip of a film that his, his indie studio has been working on. It's a, um, we saw a scene, I don't know exactly the whole thing, but we saw a scene where uh, there was uh, uh, like a teenage boy and a, and a slightly younger girl um, out doing some stuff in nature. But uh, the, the girl happens to be nonverbal um, in the way she communicates. And she's a little challenging to, to be in presence with. So um, he thinks it's really important to tell stories and his medium happens to be animation. And um, there was a, there was a, I think these were connected. There was an interesting, some of the other things that have been going on in AI salon, we talk a lot about, you know, whether the technology is good or bad or how to adopt it and what to do with it. Um, uh, Kyle, I, I heard Kyle say this, uh, and um, I can't even quite grasp the context because it was in a bunch of stuff that we do all together. But, um, but what he, the, the question Kyle had for us, um, in, you know, the, the, the common question when you're talking about AI is like, oh my God, what if the AI takes over and, you know, kills us all or something like that? And he's like, 
it's not a very interesting question and it doesn't seem very realistic either. What if the real question is, what if AI helps us to be more human? And I suspect that, that that question made a ton of sense in the context of AI Salon and especially watching this guy tell stories about how Inside Out is this amazing and wonderful thing and, and a bunch of, you know, bunch of parents on the call said, oh my God, you know, my, you know, my kid is, this is how I related with some of my kids during their adolescence, right? We were able to see this thing projected outside ourselves and then talk about how that worked. And it helped us become more of a family by having this external story that we could relate to, right? Uh, same thing with um, the nonverbal girl, you know, um, somebody said, oh, my, my autistic daughter's watching this and she's got tears in her eyes, right? Um, so, and then, you know, we poked at the, we, we actually are really good at asking questions with, about AI because we know a lot about AI. Um, we talked to this uh, indie, um, indie studio uh, guy and, you know, asked him about how you're adopting AI. And he talked about different ways that's super, super good at helping you be creative and run through lots of, lots of ideas quicker. Um, they, they haven't seen it to be really useful for a finished product yet because it's not, not good enough. It's not up to their standards for, you know, final, final production. Um, but it gives you a lot of like creative uh, capability to brainstorm. Um, and, uh, and then he, somebody said, so compare and contrast, you know, the, the process you, you do now and what you think AI will give you in the next couple of years uh, with Inside Out. And he's like, well, Inside Out took us six years to do. And at the peak, it was like three or 400 people working on it. So it was a very important story to tell. And I'm glad we did it. <laughs> and it was a lot of work. Um, now he sees that, you know, in, in the coming years, he'll be able to do that same kind of scale with a much smaller team. And then he's like, you know, so what happens to, what, what happens if I can do that with a 30 person team? You know, what happens to the other 270 artists or something like that? And he's like, mm, I don't know, it's, it's a, a tough one. I, it's hard to tell. But the thing that came out of it was maybe the thing to look at isn't, you know, how much quicker and cheaper you can do one film compared to another film, but how many more you could do if you could do 10 or, or 20, you know, inside out level things at, at the same time as you would have done one, um, you get to tell more stories. So somehow that connected for me to the, what if uh, uh, AI help us, helps us to be more human. Even if you don't check out AI Salon, um, and even if you don't think you're interested in this AI thing, um, there's another, everybody talks about ChatGPT. There's another one that I never hear about except for uh, a few people who, who play around with it. Uh, there's a thing called pi.ai and that's the URL, pi.ai, and you just talk with it. Um, and I haven't played around with it, so I apologize for secondhand information, but one of my, one of, my, uh, one of the, the people I work with in AI Salon, uh, he says, he's, he's, uh, he, he helps people, um, he's a volunteer in helping people cope with, with things. Um, uh, uh, and he loves pi.ai, he uses a lot himself. And he says, one of the things you can try um, is, you know how you get to the end of the day and you've got all these thoughts in your head and you can go to bed and you're tossing and turning because you can't get all the thoughts out of your head. Just like before you're going to bed, you know, uh, hit up pi.ai and chat for a while. Chat about the things that you're thinking about. Um, and uh, it's a good partner in unloading your brain for, you know, like so that you can get to sleep and that you've talked through, resolved, uh, you know, processed a bunch of the stuff that came up during the day. Do the same thing for the next day. You know, what are you, you know, talk about, talk about what you want, um, what you're thinking about doing the next day. Um, uh, I see that we're getting really close to time. I, I want to run through, let me, let me do a slideshow, 12, 12 things slideshow real quick. Um, these I found yesterday. These are like found photographs to me. Uh, and I, this is mid journey. I hit up a new thing uh, yesterday. And I was like, oh my gosh, uh, all these prompts are just, um, 
uh, take a, take a photograph with a toy camera, basically. Um, so we see a lot of AI images that are like weird and and shiny and super pretty and stuff like that. I really like the old film feel of these, and I like how photographic they got. Um, and uh, this last one in particular, that one's really cool. This last one in particular blows me away because it looks like a, to me, it looks like a photograph from 1970 or 1980, except for the One World Trade Center. This is the Brooklyn Bridge, of course, and this is Brooklyn, but this is an impossible shot too. I, I literally can't quite make myself think that this isn't a photograph, uh, a film photograph. Um, even down to like some of the fuzzy details, the, the focus and, you know, the trees and stuff like that. It's amazing stuff. So a um, lot going on with AI. Uh, thanks. I can go quickly before I get home. Um, I do have COVID. This is day 10. I've been laying on the couch for 10 days. Um, it really hit me hard. Uh, first few days, temperature 102, sleeping 20, 22 hours a day. Um, that's passed, but I uh, just have no energy. I get up and uh, just taking a shower, you know, I have to sit down after I take a shower because I'm, I'm exhausted and kind of shaky. Um, so, I just think to myself, what if I hadn't had the vaccination? <laughs> I might have been dead by now. Um, so I'm, I'm, uh, and I, I'm super grateful for people in my life, neighbors and friends who've been reading super over every day. I haven't, you know, my wife got it four days after me. She has much less, um, much more mild symptoms, but we haven't had to cook. People bring us food every day, which is just so sweet. So, you know, like, I guess I've done something right in my life if the sculpture shop take care of me. It's uh, it warms my heart. Um, I do feel like I'm on the upswing um, and I'm being really cautious and careful because I've talked to folks who've had it and they're like, you know, you really get to be careful. You can relapse very quickly and be prepared. Um, even after you feel better, it's going to take, you know, four to six weeks before you have your, your full range of energy back. So Bearing that in mind and um, practicing patience, um, I'm really tired of practicing patience, but here I am. Um, so I, I, there's this poet by the name of David Ignatow, who I really like, and um, this is a poem called As If the prayerful humanity of Bach, the soldier, machine gunning, I don't know how to reconcile one with the other and to the living where with others I walk stunned. In a cafe, music is pouring itself in joy for itself, for anyone to dream of reconciliation with conflicted life. Further down the road, an energetic man is eating his wife. How to live in confusion and as skeptic, angry, to have been born to music and to screams intermingling, as if one as if not one without the other to make a whole. Do it again. As if the prayerful humanity of Bach, a soldier, machine gunning, I don't know how to reconcile one with the other and to the living where with others I walk stunned. In a cafe, music is pouring itself in joy for itself, for anyone to dream of reconciliation with conflicted life. Farther down the road, an energetic man is beating his wife. How to live in confusion and as skeptic, angry to have been born to music and to screams intermingling, as if not one without the other to make a whole of it. That one just captures the feeling I have for being in the world today. That's fabulous. If, if you can put a link to that on the OGM list, as you often do, I will appreciate it. And thank you for that. And I'm glad you're on the upswing.
Thank you. Me too. <laughs> and, and taking it seriously and all of that. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, feel, please feel free to pour links into the chat now. I, I release you from from chat uh, purgatory, purgatory or whatever. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering like what's the right what's the right condition or what are we saying? Uh, and of course, I will be sharing the chat back and transcript back on the channel uh, so that you can go find these. <clears throat> um, and thank you. It's been really it's, a, it's been a lovely session. Totally appreciate you all being here very much. Until soon. Mike, ideas about which thing? Oh, about uh, Timu's question? Uh, you're muted right now. Yeah, sorry. Um, no, he put a question out about seeking a phrase, a buzzword for... A more productive, less toxic economy centered on medium and small producers. There you go. Distributed capitalism. I mean, the, 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 the chat already is providing some interesting ideas. That's but, really nice. That totally fits our governance uh, call questions. Yeah. Yeah. You might, I mean, if, I, I don't know if you know any other groups that might be interested in helping Tim. I know Tim very well and uh, don't always agree with his political ideas. I often agree with his diagnosis though. Yeah. And I do know if we can get a word to rally around, a lot of good people would be there. Mike, and all the they're out there so far are too long. What, what's the phrase again? Well, he's looking for something that describes uh, an economy that focuses on small and medium-sized enterprise and, you know, empowers consumers to build great new things rather than an economy that favors monopolies, economies of scale and um, and the like. He's, he's very much a, a antitrust lawyer and, you know, he's written a lot about the consolidation of the telecom sector, but uh, uh, that... Kevin Jones has been playing in that space. Uh, he's calling it neighborhood economics. He's got a third conference coming up next month in San Antonio. Oh, good. And he's yeah. got some deep work and deep thinking about this. So check in with him. Mm -hmm. um, I will also, also um, Gil, if you follow the Twitter link that Mike put in the chat, that's the exact thing that uh, he's referring to with Tim Wu, because Tim Wu is super Wooster. Yeah. Oh, okay, got it, got it, got it. Yeah, yeah, unfortunately, neighborhood economics, um, that's seven seven syllables, which is two more than uh, Mike Nelson's rule of buzzword allows. I do yeah. have a, a, another call called Net for Neighbors, which gets to that idea a little bit. Yep. But that's Net more for, redesigning the Internet, and he wants to redesign economics. But maybe there is a way to do neighbor and economics somehow and pull it maybe together. Neighbornomics? Check out, neighbor out Mike. Check out Mike Schumann also, who's been a real pioneer in this space, S-H-U-M-A-N. And he, he has a book called Small Mark. Okay. Small Mark. Small Mark as a, as a contrary Mark. to Walmart. Mark. Yeah. Yeah. Good. And he's he, okay. a terrific, terrific resource for all this stuff. Uh, this Is this the Small Mart revolution? How local yes. businesses are beating global competition? Yep. Cool. That'd be it. There's a lot, there's a lot behind that sign. His Twitter handle is small mark. <clears throat> okay. Jerry, do you want credit for neighbornomics or should I say a brilliant friend told me? <laughs> I'm sure it's been used somewhere. I'll check first. <laughs> I like I like it. I like it a lot because again, yeah. it it it's less than five syllables. And yeah. neighbornomics could actually fit in a single column grab, article headline. So Mike, grab, grab the URL and tweet handle now. <laughs> Okay. Well, I'll get off right now and do that. But anyway, th thanks for letting me complain about life. And um, I always find inspiration and in, in, in always a lot of URLs. So thank you. Thank you very, very much. This is really I fun. I, got off, I thought I got off five minutes ago, but then I heard you guys still talking. So I found you still on my computer. 
Uh, so I'm going to take advantage of that to say one thing. The family constellation stuff yeah. is weirdly uncanny. Yeah. Yes. Have you experienced it or had you heard I've of it before? It once and yeah. it was like, what the fuck is going on here? No, it's like channeling. It's so it's, it's some, yeah. I like that the person said, we don't know what's going, we don't know how this works. Right. But uh, I saw things that were just, you know, like nobody in the room could explain how they happened, but people validated them. Yep. It's very strange. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's and and the people picked up roles that were exactly and precisely right for what was happening. Yep. And then and then Michelle was very careful because as she was interpreting what was happening, she said, We don't know why they let had to let go of the baby, for example, yep. when we're not going to make things up. We don't want to project anything into here that 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 you know that, that we don't know happened historically, but here's what the emotions are and here's what's going on. And it was just super powerful. Amazing. It was great. More things okay. in heaven and earth ratio. Yep. Yeah. Can I ask one last question? Has, yeah. has there has there been any discussion about what people are doing for the total eclipse or if anybody's going to go chase it? Uh, we have not had that conversation. Uh, strangely, there's an Aikido seminar in Montreal that's right next to that eclipse and Montreal is on the on the path. Uh, yeah. but, but I'm not attending the, the seminar, but it would be a good one to go to. But mm -hmm. no, nobody's talked about it. You might get a cold, clear day to watch it. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Take care. Th thank you all. This is wonderful. Thanks.